How many of you were not here last night? Anybody? Okay, a few people. I'm going to just do a real brief review of some of the things we talked about last night, um, but I'm going to kind of go through it pretty quick. So I hope you're ready to listen fast because I'm ready to do speak fast. <laughs> so we all can go to dinner and then I'll come back and um, we'll talk some more. Now, last night I did a presentation called the Mount Hermon Roswell Connection. That's actually the second presentation that I've done. Uh, the one that I did prior to that was called Mythology and the Coming Great Deception. And in that DVD, I talked a lot about uh, some of the same things that Randy talked about earlier today regarding Nimrod and the origin of mythology, the mythological gods of the ancient world and how they trace back to Nimrod. We have those in the back, my wife's in the back back there at the table as a double feature. Uh, so you can check both of those out out there. I'm going to be talking about some content from my second book called Archon Invasion, The Rise, Fall, and Return of the Nephilim. And I have three DVDs back there. Part one deals with the Nephilim in biblical times, traces the Nephilim throughout the Bible. Part two deals with Nephilim in modern times. And in part three, this is over about four hours worth of content right here. And people are like, that's great, but I can't get my friends to sit down and watch four hours of video. <laughs> Can you like kind of condense that? I said, okay, sure. So I created another presentation where I take sort of the best of both of those and then incorporated some new stuff in this one, which is going to be the talk we're going to do tonight. It's called Archon Invasion 2045 uh, and the Quest for Immortality. We have all these DVDs in the back. Now, if you want to get a little bit more into government conspiracy and that sort of thing, then the first book, Babylon Rising, the first shall be last, is what you're in. You should be checking out. Uh, and I have two DVDs, one by the same title and another one called... 322 Tetrads in the Time of Jacob's Trouble. A lot of people are concerned about the Tetrads that are coming up in next year and the year after and the, and the Feast of the Lord and things like that. Uh, so you might want to check that out. Now, uh, when I've, I've been interested in the subject of the Nephilim for a very long time, actually since I was a kid. Uh, I was in fifth grade and they started really trying to push the theory of evolution on me. And so I raised my hand and I said, uh, if we came from monkeys, how come there's still monkeys? And the teacher couldn't answer my question, so I asked again in sixth grade, if we came from monkeys, how come there's still monkeys? And every year I asked the same question, and nobody could give me a good answer. And then between eighth grade and ninth grade, uh, they dropped the word theory from what they used to say. They used to say the theory of evolution. And when I get to freshman year in high school, they just started teaching it as a fact. I said, great! You guys proved a lot over summer vacation. Cool, I've had this question since fifth grade. If we came from monkeys, why are there still monkeys? Still couldn't answer it. So that's, okay, fine. If you're going to force that down my throat, then I'm going I'm to have another answer. And um, so in order to pass the test, they used to have to, you know, do the curriculum and whatever we were studying, you know. How old is the Earth? Well, according to the textbook, 4.6 billion years, despite the fact that we're old enough. So I, I, would, I always gave very long answers, to, but I got the answer right so I could pass the stupid test. Um, and of course, when you study creation, you naturally end up talking a lot about the flood. Because um, it explains the geologic column and fossils, where they come from in the first place and all that. But of course, when you start looking into the flood, you got to realize, well, what was the purpose of the flood in the first place? Well, Genesis 6 tells you. It's this creature called the Nephilim that was, was created as a result of angels mating with women. And so I've, I've been interested in this subject for a very long time. But when I got real intentional about it a few years ago, it's because the Lord called me out of the ministry. I was a missionary for about six and a half years. Um, Got to go a lot of places, see a lot of cool stuff, but God kept revealing stuff to me. Like this idea that, as Randy said earlier, giants, every culture that I've been to has some kind of concept of giants or hybrids, animal-human hybrids, everywhere I went. And I came back from a trip to uh, Cyprus, and on part of that trip, I got to go to uh, Greece. For, it was the second time I've been there. But I had kind of new eyes to see when I went the second time to Greece. And uh, you can't look anywhere. Everywhere you look, you see the re remnants of a toppled statue of a god or a temple or some kind of representation of a satyr, a minotaur, or, you know, a centaur, and you know, all these mythological hybrids. So you know, I'm a Star Wars fan, and I, you know, I'm thinking to myself, man, 4,000 years from now, nobody's going to remember Yoda, right? Now, George Lucas said when he created the Star Wars saga that he was trying to create a modern mythology. So you might think of George Lucas like Homer. Homer wrote, supposedly a blind poet, wrote the Odyssey and the Iliad, right? Wrote this mythological story. Well, I'm thinking nobody 4,000 years from now, nobody's going to be remembering Yoda. You know, the Jedi and the Sith and all that. But yet here I am in Greece, and like everybody, I talk to people there, they didn't learn this stuff as mythology. I have a friend that grew up in Greece, lived there most of his life. He said, Rob, we weren't taught the Odyssey and the Iliad and the ancient Greek myths as myth. We were taught as history. And they still believe this stuff. 
So I came home and I told my wife, I said, honey, you know all the animal-human hybrids we see in mythology? Yeah, I think they were real. And we had an interesting talk about it. Went to bed, and I kid you not, the next morning, she wakes up, she goes in the other, her office and uh, checks her email, and there was a, a BBC News feed article uh, that, that said, scientists had successfully cloned a sheep with a human heart. And if they could, in the article went on to say, if they continue to do this, eventually the genes are going to fuse together, and we're going to end up with animal-human hybrids, and then have all kinds of ethological, you know, eth ethical issues to deal with uh, after that. And I'm like, that, that was the next morning. I mean, talk about confirmation. I'm like, thank you, Lord. So I got real intentional about really studying this stuff. And of course, you got to go to Genesis. I mean, it starts there. And of course, I went through Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. You know, how many of you know the Torah, the five books of Moses, was the Bible of the Bible? The people in the Bible were using that as their Bible. You, on the road to Emmaus in Luke 24, Jesus is walking those, with those guys and they didn't recognize him. What does it say? It says he began with the books of Moses and the prophets and he told them everything that talked about himself. Now, I grew up, you know, good New Testament Bible believing Baptist, right? Okay, New Testament, that's great. But they didn't have New Testament on the road to Emmaus. When the Bereans were searching the scriptures daily to see if these things would be true, they weren't reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They were reading the Torah and the prophets and learning about Yeshua. And I'm like, wow, I mean, what if we did that? So, interestingly enough, I came to an understanding of Torah and the Feast of God and things of that nature by studying the Nephilim and realizing that the themes that you see in the Torah play out through the whole Bible. Isaiah 46.10 says, God declares the end from the beginning. So if I want to understand Revelation, I've got to read Genesis. And my wife actually had this idea. She said, what if we start at both ends of the Bible and work our way toward the middle? Like, read, read Genesis and Revelation and Exodus and Jude, you know, and work up with the swap. I'm like, yeah, that sounds cool. So we did. And it didn't take very long at all for us to realize that Revelation is just an amped up repeat of Exodus. I mean, the plagues are the same, I and mean, the gods that God's going against are the same. I mean, there's so much similarity there, it's unbelievable. And so I, I had a passion to try to share this with others. We, we, uh, we've, we're creating a series of books right here. This is uh, called Genesis with Related Portions from the Prophets of the New Testament. I have a 10-page introduction in here that I wrote that just explains why we're doing this, but the rest of it is just scripture. It shows how Genesis is woven throughout the Prophets and the New Testament. It shows how it's all connected. One big storyline. Um, we're doing the same with Exodus, and Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Now, of course, when I started doing that, and I started, you've heard me use the name Yeshua. Uh, I believe there's power in the name of Jesus. I'm not a sacred name or anything like that. Um, and I, I believe yod heh vav is pronounced Yehua. Some say Yehovah, some say Yahweh, whatever. There's no, there's no vowels in Hebrew, so everybody's doing the best they can with the consonants, yod heh vav uh, But I don't get all dogmatic about it. But because I started talking this way and studying this way, all my Baptist friends think, oh, what, what did you become a Seventh-day Adventist? I'm like, no. What are you, a Hebrew roots guy? I said, no, I'm not in any movement. I'm just a guy reading the Bible. But everybody wanted to put a label on me. You must be a Pentecostal. You must be a Baptist. You must be. I'm like, no. I created my own movement. So, and it's really not has nothing to do with me. It's called the whole Bible movement. <laughs> <laughs> one book, one author. Start with Genesis 1:1, one, one, go all the way to Revelation 22, 21, and believe the whole thing. I just ripped out the commercial interruptions. <laughs> so I go right from the table of contents to the maps. Okay. If you want to put a label on me, that's my label. I'm in the whole Bible movement. Okay. I believe every word from cover to cover. Uh, and it starts in Genesis. And this whole idea of the Nephilim really starts with what I, I, I call it the Genesis 6 experiment. It's what happened in Genesis chapter 6. Now, of course, I believe the Bible cover to cover. I mentioned last night a few other books that are helpful. I do not consider these books to be scripture, but I do consider them to be helpful, as did the authors of scripture. I asked a question last night. How many of you believe that the Bible is divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit written by men? Okay, then under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, God told the authors of Scripture to quote from these books, mention these books by name, and, you know, come up with ideas that are only found in these books. So I call them the synchronized, biblically endorsed, extra-biblical texts. <laughs> and the reason I say that is because they're synchronized and follow the same chronological order of events that you find in Genesis. I call them biblically endorsed because, like I said, the Bible refers to them, call them out by name, quotes from them, things like that. 
and of course, extra biblical because we don't find them within the covers of our Bible, although Enoch has been in the covers of other people's Bibles, like the Ethiopians. Um, I added one book here that you didn't see last night, and that's the Book of Jubilees. So, Enoch, Joshua, and Jubilees, I refer to them as the synchronized, biblically endorsed, extra biblical texts. They give us a lot of detail about the Genesis 6 experiment. Of course, Genesis 6, 1 and 2 says, And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Enoch synchronizes right to the same chapter and verses. First Enoch chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Identifies the sons of God as the angels, the children of heaven. Jubilees 5.1 says the angels of God. So the ancient texts are in total agreement. It's not the good sons of Seth made with the bad daughters of Cain like a lot of theologians will try to tell you. The ancient texts all agree that we're talking about angels meeting with women, as does the works of Josephus. Josephus refers to this event in the same way. I talked about this last night, the Mount Hermon Roswell connection. This is the location where the 200 watcher class angels landed in the days of Jared. This individual right here, David Flynn, discovered the location was 33.33 by 33.33 degrees, according to the Paris Prime Meridian. How many angels fell with Lucifer? One third, right? What's one third of 100? 33.33, 33.33. Right, so how interesting, there's another 33 by 33, but you end up in the ocean there between uh, you know, South Africa and Madagascar or whatever. Uh, so the only geographical landmass location on the planet that fits like a bullseye, 33 by 33, is the location where uh, 200 of the, I believe, I believe they were part of the one-third uh, of the angels uh, landed there. David Flynn also discovered it happened to be 200, or 2012 nautical miles from that location to the Paris Prime Meridian as well as 2012 nautical miles from that location to the equator. Caused a lot of people to think about that with regard to the year uh, 2012. This is Mount Hermon today, it's where it took place. Now you see in Genesis 6-4, the Nephilim were in the earth in those days and also after that, when the sons of God came unto the daughters of men and they bare children to them, the same were the mighty men that were of old, the men of renown. Now a lot of scholars, believe that the phrase, and also after that, applies to the post-flood world. I disagree with that. Moses is writing in a linear fashion. All of Genesis 6 is in a pre-flood context. All of it. Uh, and I'll explain what I believe happened in the end also after that, in a pre-flood context. One of the reasons I say that there was no multiple incursion of angels is because right here it says that these Nephilim, these, they were the same, this is right there, the same were the mighty men that were of old. The word old in English comes from the Hebrew word olam, which is a word that means forever, everlasting. So long ago, you can hardly remember when it was. Not last week when we saw the Canaanites in Numbers 13:33. Okay, so it's talking about that there was it, there was there was a, 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 a nephilim that were produced as a result of angels mating with women in the days of Jared, and then at some point after that, in a pre-flood context, they still had issues, and I'll explain why as we move forward. Okay, now. Who or what are the Nephilim? I mean, we've been using this word, the Nephilim and Nephilim and Nephilim. Uh, Randy talked about it earlier, the word Nephilim. It's actually strong as number 5303. comes from the word Nephal, properly, a feller, a bully, a tyrant, a giant. That's how Strong's defines it. But the word Nephal is strong as number 5307. It actually has a number of meanings. Most people say, they, they only pick the one that says the fallen, the fallen ones. And they say that's what it means. Well, it actually has a lot more definitions than just the fallen ones. Uh, certainly the fallen applies, but cast down, cease, divide by lot, die, let fail, to fall is the one everybody uses. Fugitive and fear, be judge, perish, rot, slay, smite out, throw down. The word is actually used 435 times in the Bible. Okay, and only twice in reference to angels mating with women. Okay, now what I found really interesting about that, and I'll show you in a minute, that number 435, keep that in mind. The word Nephilim is derived from the, the word Nephal. Nephilim are often said to be the fallen ones for that reason. Now, some associate the Nephilim with being the fallen angels themselves. I say not so. The, the text seems to clearly indicate that the Nephilim are the offspring of the angels and not the fallen angels themselves. Put more simply, I believe Nephilim can be defined as those which are fallen from their original state. In other words, the way God created them to be. Can Nephilim be produced in other ways besides being the offspring of angels? I'm going to say yes. A lot of people think no, but I'm going to say yes because the Bible says so. 
The Bible says in Numbers 13, 33, that the sons of Anak were Nephilim and came from Nephilim. Nephilim are the offspring of fallen angels, right? These Nephilim, Nephilim that came from other Nephilim. So you can get Nephilim from Nephilim. And you can get Nephilim from angels mating with women. You can get Nephilim by corrupting the image, I believe. That number I told you, 435, to remember? Uh, it just so happens to be the same number of times that the word blood is mentioned in the Bible. The word blood is mentioned 435 times, perhaps not coincidentally, the same number of times the word to fall. To fall. Except for the shedding of blood, there is no what? Remission for sin. Interesting. Again, I like to depict things visually. This is what I believe what was happening in the, uh, the first generation Nephilim timeline, okay? If my calculations are correct, and I built this timeline based on the works of people like Dr. Ken Johnson, uh, the Adams Wall Chart of the World History, Bishop's, uh, Bishop Usher's timeline, there are a number of people in the past that have taken the chronologies that we see in the scriptures, you know, so-and-so begat so-and-so begat so-and-so, and they, they realize, you know, just extrapolating it out, uh, you know, uh, assuming creation's at about 4,000, some 4,004 B.C., that this is the timeline you end up with, if that's correct. I believe the Genesis 6 experiment happened right around the ninth Jubilee, about 3,550 years before Christ, 3550 B.C. Now, Enoch, chapter 10, verses 1 through, uh, 9 through 12, or 10 through 12, tells you that uh, the first generation Nephilim would only live for 500 years. And within those 500 years, they were to kill each other off in a massive civil war. This is the civil war that, that the Greeks spun off into what became known as the Clash of the Titans. Josephus makes the connection also. He says the first generation Nephilim were the Titans of old. Okay, the heroes of old, great men of the mount, Olam, Titans. Okay, in the Greek mythology, the Titans end up in Tartarus, the prison of the gods. The book of Enoch tells you the same thing. They kill each other off, you know, and the parents, the watchers, how many of you would like to see your children massacred? Anybody? No, of course not. Enoch tells you that their offspring, they love, their, the angels love their offspring. They, they were forced to watch their beloved ones kill each other off in a massive civil war. And then the watcher parents were judged, bound, and buried in chains in Tartarus, the prison of the gods. Okay? Now that all ended right there, 500 years. Assuming 3550 is, is correct, then roughly about 3000 BC, it's done. Now, but look at what happens as you get close to that time frame there. At 3114 BC, the Aztec calendar stone shows up. And that's the one there with the Mayan calendar, 2012 and all that. That calendar shows up right there. About 20 years later, Adam, the first man on earth, dies. Shortly after that is the end of the 500-year time frame when the first generation Nephilim were to kill each other off, according to 1 Enoch chapter 10, verses 10 through 12. Sometime shortly after that, the watchers who had watched their children kill each other off were judged, bound, and buried. And then sometime shortly after that, Enoch is raptured. And about 68 to 70 years later, Noah's born. Okay, so it's all done at this point. Crazy, clash of the titans, chaos. They kill each other off, the watchers are judged on and buried, done. It's still 700 years before you get to the flood. So what happened? They got God so upset within those 700 years, 600 years of Noah's life. Okay, there is no written, there's no written documentation of any other incursions of angels mating with women. It's what's called eisegesis, where you insert your own ideas into the text. Okay? There is nothing written that says anything about angels mating with women again after the flood. There are some things that I found uh, very helpful as I was doing this research in the names of the people in the Bible. And I sort of got clued into this direction by an individual named Chuck Missler. How many of you know Dr. Chuck Missler is? Yeah. He pointed out that the uh, pre-flood patriarchs, uh, if you take the meaning of their names, you got Adam, his name means man, Seth appointed, etc. And you string them together in a sentence, the same way they appear in the scripture, this is what you end up with for a paragraph. Man is appointed in mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down teaching that his death shall bring the despairing rest. I mean, that's like the whole plan of the Bible in the names of the first ten guys, the patriarchs, you know, right there, the whole plan of the Bible right there in the names. Think God might have had a hand in maybe inspiring the parents to name their kids? There's a, a great book I can't recommend highly enough, probably the best five dollars I ever spent. It's called A Dictionary of Scripture Proper Names by J.B. Jackson. A great companion to have with you when you're reading scripture. How many of you get to those passages where so-and-so begat so-and-so begat so-and-so? And you can't read any of their names, so you're like, yeah, yeah, whatever. 
You skip it? No. Treasure trove of information in those names. With a little tool like this, it helps you uh, find it. It's also available for free online uh, in digital format. So uh, dictionary of scripture proper names will help you out. But that's the first time I'd ever seen anything like that, and that got me wondering. I wonder if it's like that elsewhere. And it is. It definitely is. Now, I want to point a few things out. Why was Jared named Jared? Well, Jared was named Jared, which his name means shall come down, or a descendant, because that's when the watchers came down. Enoch tells you the 200 watcher class angels came down, descended, in the days of Jared. Enoch's name means teaching. Well, that's what his whole ministry was about. He taught against the watchers. In fact, that's pretty much what the book of Enoch is about. Okay? Uh, and, of course, Enoch had a son named Methuselah, and Enoch was aware that God was going to bring judgment on the earth, so his, he named his son, Judgment is Coming. <laughs> that's, what, that's what Methuselah's name means. And sure enough, you know, with his death comes judgment. Methuselah died seven days of mourning later, the floodwaters came. Okay? Uh, now, if your name is Judgment is Coming when I die, and you have a kid, well, you might name your kid Despairing. <laughs> right? <laughs> you know? He was also born during the time of the Clash of the Titans. That's a pretty despairing time. He named his kid Despairing. But then something interesting happens. If you look at the timeline, I told you that 500 years was the chaos. They kill each other off. Then there was a period of peace. And his dad took a deep breath and named his kid Rest. Noah was born about 68 to 70 years after the judgment of the Watchers and the, the conclusion of the Clash of the Titans. I think the names were very revealing. So let's talk a little bit more, explore this whole idea of a pre-flood return of the Nephilim, because it's all done at that point, right? Now, using the Bible, and I'm not going to read through all of these, but I'm just going to point some things out. You can make notes or talk to me about it afterwards, just for the sake of time. We'll go through them pretty quick. But uh, using the Bible and the synchronized biblically endorsed extra biblical text, <clears throat> I discovered some really interesting things. Genesis 6, 1 through 4 talks about angels mating with humans, and that syncs up with the text you see there in red. Genesis 6, 5 through 7 shows how God feels about the resulting violence, and it syncs up with the text you see there. Genesis 6, 8 through 10 reveals how Noah and his sons were genetically pure. Randy talked about this a little bit earlier. The, where it says that Noah was found, he was righteous and you know, perfect in his generations. Yeah, he was a good guy. But when it talks about perfect in his generations, the Hebrew word is tamim. It's the same word that's used elsewhere when they're trying to find the pure red heifer without spot or blemish. You know, it, it's a word used for genetic purity. So Noah is genetically pure. I believe his wife was also genetically pure. The book of Joshua says that he got his wife, who was the daughter of Enoch, who was so righteous that he walked with God and was not, for God took him. Right? Good choice. So if Noah's pure and his wife is pure, then it just makes sense that Shem, Ham, and Japheth would all be equally pure. Everybody with me so far? Okay? So the, immediately blo the, the immediate bloodline of Noah and his wife are, is pure. Okay? But then you get to Genesis 6, 11, and 12. It says, earth and all flesh becomes corrupted. How much is all? Okay, so we're in agreement. All means all. Okay? Then Genesis 6, 13 through 17, God grows increasingly angry and tells Noah to build the ark and shows him how to do it. Sings up with the text you see there. And you find out when you look at the other texts that it only took five years to build the ark. Noah preached for 120 years. He preached repentance, right? How do you repent of being born Polish? or French, or Italian, or Spanish. Can you repent of that? So could you repent of being born a Nephilim? No. But you can repent of doing something else. And I'm going to show you what I believe they were doing. Genesis 6.18, you get the first mention of the wives of Noah's three sons. Quick quiz. Does 18 come before or after 12? 18 is after 12. How much is all? If all means all and 18 follows 12, then the wives have to fall in the category of all flesh having become corrupted. You find out that he picked the wives seven days before the flood. Okay, they had a death and a, and they had a funeral and a wedding on the same day. Methuselah died, they had seven days of mourning, and the, the three sons got married, and they had the seven day celebration of, of the wedding feast, right? In the hoopah that was the ark, basically. Now, they got their, uh, he got the three wives from Eliakim, who was uh, Lamech's brother. You'll notice that Lamech's brother didn't make it on the ark. Hmm. Okay, so, I mean, if all flesh became corrupted, Noah's choices for three wives had to have been pretty limited, right? Well, how much is all? All means all. 
Okay, seven days before the flood. Now, these guys were 98, roughly 98, 100 years old. Now, you see like in Isaiah, in the Millennial Kingdom, when somebody dies at 100, he's considered a child. Right? Same thing if you look in the pre-flood patriarchs. How long do these guys live? 900 plus years, right? Notice when they start having children. Most of them start having children after the age of 100. So we think, yeah, you know, we get married in our late teens, early 20s, most of us these days, right? Well, these guys waited to about 98 to 100. Because they lived to almost a thousand. Okay? Plus, these three guys, Shem, Him, and Japheth, had a building project, you know, helping dad, you know, herd animals, get food and stuff. After all that was done, they finally got married. But their choice for women was extremely limited. All right. Now... Genesis 6.12 was the scripture that says that all flesh had become corrupted. Let's go ahead and read it. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. Now, looking into the synchronized biblical, the endorsed extra biblical text, Joshua gives us a whole lot of more detail for this. It says, And their judges and rulers went to the daughters of men, now these are humans doing this, and they took their wives by force from their husbands according to their choice. And the sons of men in those days took from the cattle of the earth and the beasts of the field and the fowls of the air and taught the mixture of animals of one species with the other in order therewith to provoke the Lord. And God saw the whole earth and it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted its ways on the earth, all men and all animals. So as uh, Paul Harvey would say, and that's the rest of the story. <laughs> that's what was taking place. That's what they had the ability to repent of doing. They were mixing themselves with animals. You can't repent of being born French or being born a Nephilim. So that would have been useless for Noah to have been preaching that for 120 years. Hey, repent for being born. <laughs> what are you going to do with that? But you can repent of that. Stop blending yourself with animals. Why were they doing that in the first place? Hold that thought. Jubilee 724 it says that after this, this is in a pre-flood context. This is after the flood and Noah is telling sort of a, a recap of why the flood happened in the first place. When you get to Jubilee 7, it's a recap of what happened. Okay? He's entirely in a pre-flood context, Jubilee 7 verses 1 through 23. Talking about the watchers mating with women, being judged, bound, and buried, and all that. And he said, and after this, in a pre-flood context... The after this, Jubilee 724, is the after that of Genesis 6 4, confirmed with the second witness. <laughs> they sinned against the beasts and the birds and all that moved and walketh on the earth, and much blood was shed on the earth, and every imagination and desire of men imagined vanity and evil continually. And we see in Scripture also in Genesis, it says that they had only evil continually in their hearts and minds. Right? What would cause somebody to have only evil continually in your heart and mind? I mean, the Nazis were bad people, right? Did a lot of bad things. But I'm sure they had a tender moment with their wives and kids every now and then. They didn't have only evil continually. But these people did. Now, again, do we take Scripture literally or not? If it says only evil continually, okay, Moses, I'm going to believe you. Okay, writer of Jubilees, sure. You agree with Genesis, I'll agree with you. Now, sinned against the animals is a reference to genetic manipulation, as we saw in the text, which created the animal-human hybrids of mythology, which appears to have also made a way for the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim to have host bodies to once again inhabit, thus bringing about the return. Were you all here for Randy's talk earlier? Anybody not here? Randy described the difference. There is a difference between demons and fallen angels. <coughs> Fallen angels are fallen angels. They have bodies of their own. They get around just fine. But demons, what are they always looking for? A body to get into. I mean, what prompts somebody to say, hey, you know what? I think I'm going to blend myself with a goat. What do you think, honey? Yeah, I want to do a horse. Why? Why do people all of a sudden decide to blend themselves with animals? I think the fallen ones were inspiring them to do something. To create a body that would not have a God-prescribed nefesh to go into. What's a nefesh? Where God, yes, that's right, spirit. Where God breathed into Adam's mouth, it says he became a living soul. The word soul in English is, comes from the Hebrew word nefesh. And scripture is really clear that everything must reproduce after its kind, right? So I believe there's a God prescribed nefesh for a cow, for a horse, for a bird, for a, you know, a dog, for a human. 
But when you blend them and you create something that doesn't have a God-prescribed nefesh to go into, well, all you did was create a shell that's fit for another spirit to go into. I believe that's how the Nephilim returned before the flood. They came through that way. And when you corrupted the image that God said he created man in his own image, it also corrupted their mind, it corrupted their heart, and they had only evil continually from that point on, and were extremely violent. There's an individual named Dr. Judd Burton who wrote a book called Interview with the Giant. He has this great quote in the beginning of his book talking about this. He says, despite the loss of their physical bodies, talking about the Nephilim being killed in the flood, there is reason to believe that the giant's spirits continued to exist. In this state, they were and are demonic entities. Like other sentient creatures, they have an eternal spirit at their essence. Therefore, the Nephilim and related tribes of giants never really ceased to exist. Only their physicality was lost. So there's a lot of disembodied spirits out there, and Jesus had to deal with a bunch of them, didn't he? In the first century. Casting out demons all the time. Right? I'm going to put this graphic back up. I've expanded it just a little bit more for you. And yes, I, I agree with Randy. I've got T-Rex there. I think that perhaps God may have created like the Apatosaurus, uh, sauropod class dinosaurs. I believe that's what the behemoth is in Job chapter 40. Where he talks about, behold now behemoth, his tail moves like a cedar tree. No, that's King James. If you've got some of the newer English, it says it's a hippo. I'm like, you ever see the tail of a hippo? It's <laughs> a little wispy thing in the back. You know, that's usually my litmus test when I'm going to buy Bible translations. I flip through Job 40, 15 through 20. Like, well, how do they translate behemoth? Hippo? Toss it. There's no hippo walking around with a cedar tree for a tail. Okay, but when you read that whole thing, you know, behold now behemoth, which I made with thee. He eateth grass like an ox. Lo, now his strength is in his loins and his force is in the navel of his belly. He moveth his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his stones are wrapped together. His bones are as strong as pieces of brass. His bones are like bars of iron. He is the chief of the ways of God. He that made him can make his sword to approach unto him. That doesn't sound like a hippo. <laughs> Hippos are pretty impressive, but uh, I think an apatosaurus is walking by and God's like, look at that. <laughs> That's the chief of my ways there. Because lizards will grow to, till they die. Right? In the pre-flood world, you had more oxygen, you had pressurized oxygen, a perfect environment with a canopy and everything. I think they just kept growing big. But I think those were part of the species, you've seen jubilees, that they messed around with reptiles also. And they probably took existing uh, good dinosaurs and created the carnivores, the, the velociraptors, the T-Rex, the violent creatures that consume everything. Right? Now, of course, that would mean that they, if, if that's true, the sauropods survived because they would have gone in the ark. Now, how old is Noah at this point? 600 years old. Do you think he's smart enough to maybe get a small apatosaurus? <laughs> you know, he's not going to get 145 footers. They, okay, back up. Boop, boop, boop. Nice way. Nice boop. No. He's going to get a baby. Right? He's going to be smart enough. Why do I say that? Because there's evidence of sauropod class dinosaurs carved in rock where you show a human being next to a long neck, long you know, tailed dinosaur in the post-flood world. You, you see stegosaurus carved into the temples in Cambodia. So I believe that the vegetarian class were created by God. These were corrupted versions of that. They didn't make it on the ark. <laughs> uh, and you got the other hybrids and stuff like that too. Now, as I was thinking about this whole idea of only evil continually in their hearts and minds, and just thinking about this idea of animals being blended with humans, why? Why did they do it? There's a movie that came out called Splice. Now, I don't recommend you see this. Now, of course, I hate saying that because as soon as you say to somebody, don't do this, everybody goes, done. You know, you can have anything you want. Don't eat that tree. What they do, they go grab a food off that tree. Okay? Please don't go see this movie. It's a disturbing movie, and I don't recommend it. Um, as a filmmaker, a lot of times I like to see the special features. Uh, you know, I, I get really more into the special features sometimes in the movie itself. Well, I happen to come across the special features of the movie Splice. In this movie, scientists blend animals and humans together, an animal and a human together to create a creature called Dren. Now, listen to what the filmmaker said their goal was. Pay attention to what he said their goal was for Dren. Why did they create the creature Dren? What his goal as a writer was. Splice is about two young, brilliant scientists played by Adrian Brody and Sarah Pauly. 
And uh, what they do is create hybrid organisms by splicing DNA from different species for a large pharmaceutical company. But they're young and they're ambitious. And what they really want to do is add human DNA to the mix. But the company objects to this, so they do it in secret. And then terrible, terrible things result. Specimens need to be detained. Don't call her that. What's going on? Part of the excitement of watching this film is not knowing what Dren will ultimately become. Because she evolves in her life cycle, she evolves in a very radical way. And, uh, and she actually begins as, as something quite ugly, it's a, a creature or a child that only a mother could love. But as she grows, she turns into something quite beautiful. Something that is possibly a step up on the evolutionary ladder. I always thought of Dren as a genetically engineered angel. So, so she was always going to have a kind of bird component to her, and she was always intended to have wings, and there was always going to be something delicate and beautiful about her, which, again, is where this movie departs from Frankenstein, because Frankenstein's monster is, was always going to be grotesque, mm -hmm. because he's made from dead tissue. Whereas I thought Dren should really be something that's higher up on the evolutionary ladder. It's something, you know, maybe that's more beautiful than a human being. More beautiful than a human being. All right, dude. That guy's got some sick taste in women, I guess. Uh, but did you catch what he said? They wanted to create a genetically engineered angel. Hollywood gets it. I mean, they understand this stuff. The church is completely clueless. They're all talking about the Sethite theory. Okay. <laughs> But Hollywood gets it, probably because they're channeling <laughs> demonic entities who are telling their story. And then you watch these guys, they all say, yeah, I channeled, you know, I channeled this, I channeled that. Yeah, that's what they're doing. Nephilim are telling their story. All right? And in the, in the story, it starts off as a really grotesque kind of creature and starts to morph into this baby adolescent and try to make her into some sexy looking hybrid woman. But at the end of the movie, she morphs into a he and becomes a male fallen angel looking creature at the end of the movie. I'm like, that's exactly what I think was going on in the pre-flood world. The God, God's so upset that he decided to wipe out the entire planet because all flesh had started participating in this. You know, and uh, while I was thinking along these lines, I happened to have uh, these two books sitting on my desk arranged in this order. Doug Hamp, my friend there, had his book on the left, and I had Tom and Nita Horn's book, Forbidden Gates, on the right, sitting on my desk right there. And I'm thinking along these lines, I look down, and I'm like, huh, I wonder if that's the formula. If corrupting the image leads to opening forbidden gates that brings about the creation of Nephilim, <laughs> abominations, things that were never meant to exist in the first place, creatures that end up having only evil continually in their heart and mind. And again, as I'm thinking along those lines, a movie comes out called... The Amazing Spider-Man. And in this movie, this guy here, he's a good philanthropic doctor. He's an amputee here. He's got an idea. He's like, I wonder why is it you can cut the tail off of a lizard and it grows back? What's the genetic code that does that? So he starts to experiment. He's got a mouse there missing a leg, you know, and uh, he injects the lizard DNA into the mouse. And finally, after some, a few tries, he gets one that works. It's successful. So he tries to try it out on himself. He injects himself with lizard DNA, and what do you know, his arm grows back. Great, but he had an unfortunate side effect. He became a giant lizard creature, Nephilim, I would say, that had only evil continually in his heart and mind. Started out as a good guy, wanted to help people. Injects himself with lizard DNA and becomes the lizard monster enemy of Spider-Man. But note the propaganda. Spider-Man's also a hybrid, isn't he? Good hybrid and fights the bad hybrid. Don't you want to have superpowers like Spider-Man? Hmm. That's what I think was going on in the pre-flood world. Let's talk about the post-flood return of the Nephilim. Okay, if those guys were all wiped out, how did they get back? Well, I believe the Bible tells us how they came back. Now, first I want to point out something. Who made it and who didn't? All right? Genesis chapter 6, verse 20. Of fowls after their kind, and of cattle after their kind, of every creeping thing of the earth after his kind, two of every sort shall come unto thee to keep them alive. What's the repetitive phrase there? <laughs> Open book test, right? I put, put in bold for you. Okay, Genesis chapter 7, 13 and 14. In the selfsame day, 
entered Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah and Noah's wife, and the three wives of his sons with them into the ark. They, and every beast after his kind, and all the cattle after their kind, and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth after his kind, and every fowl after his kind, every bird of every sort. What curious phrase is missing with regard to the humans? Hmm. Just says they. Then you turn to uh, Genesis chapter 7, verses 20 through 22. Okay, the waters come down. Fifteen cubits upward did the waters prevail, and the mountains were covered, and all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl and of cattle and of beasts and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, and every man, all in whose nostrils was the breath of life, of all that was in the dry land died. What curious phrase is missing? After their kind. That's what got wiped out. Now, it says that of the people that got in the ark, it does not say after their kind. Is that an argument? Well, I think it's a, a little bit of an argument, but let's keep going and see if we can build a case here. Genesis chapter 10, we have the table of nations is what it's often referred to. It gives you Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and all the people that came from them, right? I talk about that at some length in my Mythology in the Coming Great Deception DVD. And uh, when you look at this list, you realize that all, okay, all post-flood giants trace back to these people. Go read Genesis 10 and see if you see angels anywhere in the mix. You're not going to see them. If you see them, it's because of eisegesis. You put things in there out of your head into the text that doesn't exist. Now, when you look at the people, you've got Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and you start looking into their lineage and the, you know, their offspring, you see that Canaan was loaded with giants. His offspring, he had a bunch of giants. There's at least one giant in Mitzrayim's lineage, that's Kaphtor. Kaphtor had, uh, had a, it was the son of Mitzrayim. Kaphtor settled the island of Crete. But what I found intriguing about that was all of Greek mythology originates in Crete. So if you want to know where all the Titans and Olympians and demigods and all that stuff comes from, what goes back to that guy? Kaphtor, son of Mitzrayim, son of Ham, stepped off the ark. There's no evidence of giants in Put's lineage that I could find. Uh, and there's evidence of at least one giant in Cush's lineage, but he was not born that way. That would be Nimrod. Nimrod, I uh, strongly believe, began, began to become a mighty one, King James says. It's Geborim in Hebrew. Uh, the word means strong, courageous, mighty man, sure, but it also can mean giant. Uh, and what's interesting is when the writers of Septuagint translated that, they use the same word, Giganus or, or Gigantus, they use the same word for Genesis 10, 8, 9, which describes Nimrod becoming a mighty one. They use the same word there that they use for giant in Genesis chapter 6, verse 4. But when they got to David's mighty men, they weren't Nephilim, were they? No, they were busy killing them. So, but they took the same Hebrew word, Giborim, and they translated it as Ton Dinaton, or Ton Dinatons, which meant courageous, mighty warrior. So the Hebrew scholars that wrote the Septuagint knew, knew the difference in the context of how to translate the same Hebrew word to Borim with regard to David's mighty men versus Nimrod, who began to become a giant. Don't have time to get into how that happened, but that's an interesting study. Now, at first, that's the only place that I saw giants until I started looking into historical accounts and found that there are actually giants also in Japheth's lineage. Uh, there are no giants to speak of in Shem's lineage. Because Shem uh, was th through him that the Messiah would come. Uh, I stood on the Great Wall of China in 2006, and come to find out, the Great Wall of China was originally referred to as the ramparts of Magog. Now, see all those little people there? <laughs> Look how big that wall is. That's serious overkill if you're just trying to keep out six foot tall invaders. <laughs> and it's very long. I mean, that thing is just ridiculously huge and long. Uh, but when you look at through, throughout history, just do a Google search on giant plus Gog and Magog, and you're going to find all sorts of historical accounts that Gog and Magog were giants. They built this wall to keep out giants, the ramparts of Magog. In fact, every year to this day in uh, England, now this is, I think, in Australia, this is uh, the two statues of Gog and Magog right there. But in England, every year, there's a thing called the Lord Mayor Parade. And in the Lord Mayor Parade, they marched these two statues of two giants through the streets of the UK called Gog and Magog. All right. Now, Randy pointed something out to you that all of our presidents are related. 
That's absolutely true. I, I figured out the same thing and wrote about it in my first book and realized that all 44 presidents are not only related to each other, but they all can be traced right back to one guy, King John Lackland, signer of the Magna Carta, who happened to be the guy who started the Lord Mayor Parade. So you want to talk about blue bloods and Nephilim bloodlines and royalty and all that stuff? It goes back to these guys. And our presidents just so happen to be related to these guys. Okay? They are very good at lying to you. And when they say, you know, we believe in the God of the Bible, I think we need to start asking, which God of the Bible would that be? Yeah. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Or, you know, would it be Mullet or, you know, Remphan or, you know, Chamash or, you know, Asheroth? Which one? We've got to be a lot more savvy. We, Jesus said we know them by their what? Not their campaign slogans? <laughs> right? George H.W. Bush, when he was running for office, they said, uh, are you a Christian? And he stam you know, stammered and stumbled over his words, and he said, well, if you mean have I been born again, then yes, I am a Christian. Wow. And all the Christians said, woohoo, George Bush is a Christian! The problem is you don't realize the Skull and Bone Society that both he and his father and George W. are all part of the Skull and Bone Society. They have a sick, perverted ritual where they lay down naked in the casket, do all kinds of perverted things, come up out of the casket, and they are said to be born again, brother, dot, 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 into the Skull and Bone Society. So they tricked you. They used our Christianese, right? Our Christian lingo. They pulled a fast one on you. Pulled one on me, too. I was a hardcore W fan, you know. Supported him, all that stuff. Then I realized, you know what? These guys are all Luciferians. Yeah. They truly are. That's another seminar. I'm getting a rabbit trail here. Okay, but it goes back. You know, Gog and Magog. If it's true that Gog and Magog are giants, and the historical account seems to bear this out, then the Ezekiel 38 war takes on a whole new meaning. The war of Gog and Magog, everybody's talking about. Oh, it's Russia. It's China. Eh, maybe not. Could have something more to do with these guys. Now, when you look at Genesis chapter 10, verses 6 through 20, with this handy little book right here, to help you understand what the names of these guys, what they want their names mean, you find some very interesting names right there. In fact, if you string them together like Chuck Missler did with the pre-flood patriarchs, this is what you end up with. Just taking the names in the same order that they're listed in Genesis 10, 6 through 20. He raged a black terror, double straight afflicted trafficker. Black terror, drink thou anguish. Compass the chamber, thunder, compass the smiting. He who is coming, their love, we shall rebel. That's Nimrod, we shall rebel. A double straight fire brand, travailing, affliction of water, blades opening the moistened morsel, forgiven ones bowing to spy. A trafficker hunting terrors, trodden down sayers, the strangers draw near. Showers of life, gnawing like thorns, they shall break loose. Double woolen enclosures of wrath. That's an interesting family tree. Okay, what prompts, you know, we know the characters in the Bible, they named their children for a reason, right? You know, Esau came out red and hairy, so they named him red and hairy. Hey, Harry, you know, Esau. Jacob came out holding his heel, so they named him heel grabber, right? Jacob. So what prompts a parent to look down at their newborn baby and say, enclosure of wrath, what do you think, honey? <laughs> right? Why do you name your kid moistened, you know, you know, firebrand or whatever? Terror. I mean, did you ever think that? Any parents in here look down at your child and think, yeah, enclosure of wrath or terror? Something's up with these kids. No mention of angels anywhere. And uh, I showed you this chart last night. They, they show up very quickly uh, in the, in the post-flood world. And uh, you see in Numbers 13.33 that they encountered the Anakim, who were sons of Anak, who was the son of Arba, who was an Amorite. The Amorites descended from Amorius, son of Canaan, son of Ham, who stepped off the ark. No mention of angels anywhere, right? Clean line, right? Right back to the occupants of the ark. And we see uh, this is what they probably look like. I showed that slide last night. This is what the Israelites were up against. If you believe the scriptures where it says Amos 2.9, it says the uh, Amorites got as tall as cedar trees. But, but Caleb's like, who's bigger? Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. That dude had some faith. But it helps us understand that giants were real, right? And this book right here I mentioned last night, The History of Baalbek by Michael Alouf, talked about the, uh, around the same time as the Tower of Babel, after the flood, when Nimrod reigned over Lebanon, he sent giants to rebuild the fortress of Baalbek. 
Nimrod in Tower of Babel, that's all about 100 years after the flood. So 100 years after the flood, Nimrod's already got a workforce of giants to go help him build some of the megalithic structures that it helps us explain how stones like that could have been quarried, cut, and moved, right? Right after the flood. Now, I want to demystify something for you regarding how they became giants. I mean, we think, okay, angel made to women get giant. Okay, well, yeah, scripture says that. But is that the only way you can get a giant? No. In fact, uh, I, I believe when you're forming a theory, which has more weight? Possibility or probability? Yeah? Okay. Well, let's look for empirical evidence. Uh, you could go to ligerliger.com, ligerliger.com, and read all about the ligers. How interesting, this is their homepage, that they named the ligers after the Nephilim, Hercules, Zeus, and Dad Vulcan. Listen carefully to how these things were produced and why they became so big. This big guy is a liger. Yes, a liger. And trainer Doc Antle and his partner Rajani have the biggest one in the world. This is Hercules, who is our liger boy. 900 pounds and 12 feet tall. He's a gigantic kid because he's a liger. Father lion, mother tiger makes it. Father is a lion. Mother is a tiger. Makes him the liger. Uh, Hercules is skilled at, uh, well, her, eating her, 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 about a hundred pounds of meat a day. Everything about him seems exaggerated. They seem to live longer. They eat more. We've never seen anything happen in the ligers except bigger, stronger, faster. It's theorized that ligers are this enormous size because the inhibitor growth gene exists in the female lion and in the male tiger. So when you switch around and you get a male lion breeding with a female tiger, creating a liger, you get this gigantic size. Nothing tells it when to stop. In the wild, this enormous size wouldn't necessarily be of any advantage because it would require so much more food. Samson here could readily eat 25 pounds of food in a sitting where an adult lion can subside on seven to ten pounds of food. Helps you understand why scripture says the land devours itself. And they're talking about the Nephilim giants in the land of Canaan. And I do agree with Randy that they were genetically modifying food. In fact, I talk about it in my book that the scale of the grapes actually tells you how big the giants were. I don't have time to get into that right now. It's kind of, kind of cool. But the size of the grapes actually reveals the size of the giants. Uh, that were there. But you see what happened. The, the female lion has the code that tells the creature to stop growing. Right? And the male tiger has that code. So when you switch it, you get a male lion with a female tiger, you get two beings together that don't have a code to tell them when to stop growing. I mean, if you think of your genes, your DNA as just on and off switches, codes, well, it's as simple as that. I have a, a code in me that's turned on that says Rob stops growing at 5 foot 11 at about 16 years of age. You've got a code in you that tells you when, when you stop growing. So it's as simple as either removing the code or turning it off. Boom, you got a giant. Simple. Proven fact. Empirical evidence right there. Okay. Were the giants sterile? Now, a lot of people I've heard that study the Nephilim are always saying the giants are sterile, the giants are sterile. I'm like, do you guys read the Bible? Look, it says right here, Numbers 13, 33. And there we saw the giants, Nephilim, the sons of Anak which come of the Nephilim, or of the giants. And we were in our own side as grasshoppers. You see in 2 Samuel 21, 16 through 22, these giants right here, six fingers, six toes, were also born to the giant, right? We see in 2 Samuel 12, 22, these four were born to the giant in Gath. So clearly the giants were not sterile. Multiple confirming witnesses of that. So giants aren't sterile. What about the idea of... Female Nephilim. Were there female Nephilim too? Again, I hear a lot of scholars say, no, there weren't. Well, I'm going to challenge that. I've got a section here I call Suspicious Women and the Rise of the X-Men. What am I talking about here? Well, we see scriptures like this. Deuteronomy 3, 5 through 7. And all these cities were fenced with high walls, gates, and bars beside unwalled towns a great many. And we utterly destroyed them as we did unto Sihon, king of Heshbon, utterly destroying the men women and children of every city. Now, Steve Quayle has said something that I could not agree with more. He said, the understanding of Genesis 6 and the Nephilim 
is the Rosetta Stone for unlocking, unlocking all of Scripture and history. That's a paraphrase, but I agree with that 100%. Because growing up, I always had a hard time with the Old Testament. The Old Testament used to tweak me out. I mean, it's like the New Testament was great, you know, and Jesus is loving everybody. It's kind of like good cop, bad cop. You know, dad was scary, Jesus was cool. You know, uh, you know, he loved everybody, he hung out with publicans and sinners, didn't judge anybody. You know, he's casting out demons, it's great. But dad was over there, kill the women, kill the children, kill the animals, what about everything? <laughs> and you get to John, I think it's chapter 14, where Philip asked Jesus, hey, you know, show us the Father. And Jesus said, Philip, what are you, what are you talking about? You've been with me for three years, you asked me this? Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen my father. Man, that never computed in my head. Because I don't get it. Dad's killing everybody and Jesus is really cool. Until you realize who it was that God was telling the Israelites to wipe out. Again, go back to Genesis chapter 10, verses 6 through 20. Those are the ites that the Israelites were told to utterly destroy, including the women. So you've got a choice here. Either God is prejudiced, schizophrenic, and into random acts of genocide... Or, he's got a reason for doing that. And I choose to believe we have a loving father who loves his children. And the reason why he was saying, kill the women, kill the children, kill the animals, wipe out everything in certain places. Because he'd go over here and they could keep the women and children as spoils of war. But then you go over here and you got to really destroy everything. What's the difference between these two cities? Normal people, Nephilim people, including females. Over there. Okay, there's another scripture, Deuteronomy 7, 1 through 7, where it talks about utterly destroying them and also says they can't marry them. Don't have anything to do with these people. You know, Abraham couldn't get a Canaanite, right? With, with regard to Isaac, Isaac, don't marry a Canaanite. Right? Jacob, don't marry a Canaanite. Right? Of course, Jacob has 12 sons. Which one's the only one that married a Canaanite? Judah. Where's Messiah come through? Judah, right? Lion of the tribe of Judah. Go figure that the one of 12 that decides to go off the path was Judah. But God had a plan that my wife calls Operation Leverage <laughs> with Tamar. If you've read the story, you know, Judah has three sons with this Canaanite woman. And God says he found the first one wicked in his sight. He said the person was wicked. Go figure, he married a Canaanite. <laughs> Man, when he, he married Tamar, now it tweaked me up for a long time because a lot of people thought Tamar was a Canaanite. I'm like, no way, because Tamar is in the ancestry of Christ. I said, there's no way Tamar could be a Canaanite. I was obsessed with finding the answer because I'm like, how could there be Canaanite blood in the Messiah, you know, or any kind of relation in it at all? There's not. She comes, it turns out she's of the house of Shem. And the book of Joshua tells you that. I was like, oh, shoot, thank you. Because uh, that really messed me up. But, you know, if you know the story, the firstborn son dies, left no heir. So Tamar moved to the second. And then he would have sex with her, but he wouldn't, you know, I'm not going to go much deeper than that. But anyway, he wouldn't impregnate her. And uh, so God killed him off, too. And then the youngest son wasn't old enough to marry. So he put Tamar aside so the youngest grew up. But then Judah had second thoughts. because He's like, I think she's cursed because, look, I've lost two sons already. I'm not going to give her the youngest. So Tamar said, oh, Yeah. <laughs> Got dressed up as a prostitute, waited alongside the road, and seduced Judah, ended up getting pregnant, and produced Perez, and that leads to the pure line of Christ. Operation Leverage. Pretty cool. The Bible's full of really cool stories if you know what to look for. Especially when you plug in the equation of the Nephilim, because they're all over the place. Uh, and you miss it in English. You really got to dive into the, the original languages. Uh, female Nephilim in, in your Bible, you got the Diana of the Ephesians, Artemis also, Ashtoreth of the Zidonians, the Queen of Heaven in the book of Jeremiah, you got Isis right there, Queen of Heaven, the Sirens, Ishtar, okay, there are plenty of depictions. When you look into the mythology, such as the Greek mythology, where you have the Titans, now remember, J Josephus likened the Titans, the first generation Nephilim, well, they were paired up in male and female in the Greek mythology. You had female titans and male titans, and you had female Olympians and male Olympians. That's something else you must know. That, uh, okay, angel mates with human creates a Nephilim slash titan. Well, even in the Greek mythology, we had another class of gods, didn't you? At the Olympians, right? A lower class. And so titans would mate, mate with titans, they would also mate with women, and they would do all kinds of stuff, and you end up with Olympians. Olympians would mate with Olympians, they would also mate with women, and they had the demigods. And in the uh, Sumerian mythology, you had the Anunnaki and the Agigi. Uh, in the biblical account, in uh, Jubilees, it talks about the Nephilim and the uh, Eljo. 
So all the different accounts, different people were talking about different classes of watered-down genetic Nephilim, if you will, that you have. And I believe this also explains why the giants got smaller and smaller after the flood. Pre-flood world, they're massively huge, titans. Post-flood world, you got Agamashan, he's pretty impressive. And then you got Goliath, he's a runt. But even Og is 13, 15 feet tall, 18 feet, some people say. Goliath's 9 to 12 feet. What happened? Why are they getting smaller? Watered down genetics, in my opinion, uh, by interbreeding. Now, you have historical accounts like this, Akhenaten and Nefertiti. Now, that's not just a really cool hat she's wearing right there. She's covering up <laughs> a dome of a head. Okay? She's got a pretty wild-looking head there. And so did her children. And you see Akhenaten and his wife, they got little kids on their lap and a little one on her shoulder there. Well, you know, even the little kids have the elongated head there. Okay, I've got a, a replica of one out there in, in the lobby you can check out. It's kind of an interesting story, actually. Uh, I get a phone call from a friend of mine. Uh, he says, uh, Jeff Randall, he says, hey, Rob, I had talked to this guy like five years. We, we met each other a while back and then lost contact with him. I haven't talked with him five years. Calls me up out of the blue. He says, uh, so I'm doing a Google search, right, on Nephilim, and I, I see your name, like, all over the place. <laughs> I saw all these videos and blogs and whatever. It's like, when did you get into that? I said, ah, I've kind of always been into it. I just kind of recently started writing about it and producing videos. He said, well, we need to talk. He was living in New York. That's why we lost contact. And he uh, looked me up on my website. He said, let's, uh, I'm coming back to Dallas. Let's go to lunch. I said, okay. So we go to lunch. And when we go to lunch, he gives me this. This is uh, an authentic replica of a female, I believe, Nephilim conehead skull from Peru. Okay? And he's like, maybe this will help you with your research. I'm like, dude, yeah! That's awesome, man! I mean, how cool is that? But it's a seriously strange skull when you look at it. Now, a lot of people say these conehead skulls are the result of headboarding, you know, strapping boards to babies' heads because, you know, the head's still forming or whatever. Headboarding will change the shape of your skull, but it's not going to increase your cranial capacity so you have 25 to 30 to 40 percent more brain. That's not going to happen. And it's not going to change the suture pattern on your head. You have a frontal lobe, two parietal, and an occipital plate. You know, we've got a vertical line going this way. Well, you look at the skull that I got back there, and I, I forgot to bring the female skull. The female one's even more pronounced. It has a frontal lobe, but it doesn't have the two parietal. And it, so it has another one going this way, and then the occipital. So uh, headboarding is not going to change the suture pattern. And it's not going to give you more cranial capacity. It's just going to change the shape of your head. Uh, the female versus the male. The males tend to be bigger, have more robust uh, jaws, things like that. They find these by the hundreds. And not just in Peru. They find them all over the place. They found them in Siberia and different places around the world. They're finding these things. In fact, uh, fairly recently, this is an article from uh, December 18th of last year, 2012. And the caption, this is their picture of the conehead skull they found in Mexico. And the caption said, The incredible alien skull discovered in a Mexican cemetery. 1,000-year-old skeleton. Archaeologists in Mexico today revealed the astonishing skull of a person suffering from a cranial disfiguration. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. You know, headboarding doesn't explain a lot of these. Some of them it does. A lot of them it doesn't. Including this one right here. This is from a, a book by uh, David Hatcher Childress and Brian Forster, their book, uh, The Enigma of Cranial Defamation. Uh, it has this depiction right there, and it says, Two crania, both of children, scarcely a year old, had in all respects the same form as those of adults. The same formation of the head presents itself in children yet unborn, and of this truth we have had convincing proof inside of a fetus enclosed in the womb of a mummy of a pregnant woman aged about seven months. Okay, so this is a fetus inside the mummified remains of a pregnant woman, looking like alien. That's not headboarding. That thing hadn't even been born yet. A shape like that. So, you know, here's an artist's representation. Oh, actually, this is what I call the first home alone. Oh, no! I've got a cone head! That's a, ba that's a baby cone head. But look at the size of that kid's head compared to his body. I mean, that's a serious head going on there. Right? Uh, the, the female skull, this is it superimposed on the left of the normal human skull. 
to show the difference in the cranial capacity, how much more brain it had. You know, probably, this, these creatures probably had significant, you know, how much brain power did they have? I mean, they say we use, what, 7 to 10% of our brain, whatever now. Uh, what, what capacity did they have with, with brains like that? Did they have other abilities, telepathy? I mean, what? It's not hard to imagine that they might have had increased intellectual capacity in some, in some fashion, right? Now, artists had put clay on it and stuff and modeled and figured this is what she might have looked like. Something like that. Now, my speculation, it is just speculation, is that perhaps that's what the wives of Noah's three sons may have possibly looked like. If all flesh had been corrupted and they had done something to increase their intellectual capacity, maybe that's what they looked like. Why would I say that? Because somewhere down the line, the people that they're digging up in Mexico and Peru had ancestors that have to be traced back to the flood. Right? Where did they come from? They had to have gotten those genetic traits somehow. So I suggest possibly that Noah's three sons may have been something like that. If that doesn't suit your fashion, you know, maybe they look something like this instead. <laughs> You'll note that they're emulating, minus the increased intellectual capacity. <laughs> why are they doing this? Why are they emulating that? I mean, why did people, what possesses a parent to say, hey, you know, we got a baby here, it's so beautiful. Let's strap some boards to its head. Why did they do that? Because they're emulating something that they saw or that they were aware of. These conehead people were often found in positions of royalty. They were the leaders of the society, the Akhenaten and Nefertiti's of ancient history. So you want your kid to have a future? You make his, your kid to look like a conehead <laughs> back then. They're emulating something. You know, perhaps that's what they look like. There's the three wives of uh, Noah's three sons. <laughs> <laughs> Speculation, of course. Uh, and, you know, maybe we're talking about X-Men. You know, maybe we're not talking about necessarily everybody's a satyr, a, a minotaur, or whatever. Maybe they just had increased abilities. You know, you, you blend a human with a bat, maybe you get, you know, a Batman with, uh, you know, radar. Right? You blend a human with a dolphin, and a human, you got an Aquaman as sonar. Right? You know, blend yourself with spiders. You got Spider-Man, you get Wolverine, you get stuff like that. Could the X-Men, and what has been will be done again, Solomon says, could be the reason why we're seeing all these movies is the Nephilim or, you know, people are channeling these stories, are telling their story. And how many kids, you know, don't, that say, I want to be like Wolverine. I want to be like Spider-Man. Making it really appealing to want to blend yourself with the genetics of something else to give yourself increased abilities that you don't have right now. Right? I did find it interesting that this particular X-Men slash woman uh, just so happens to have six toes. Go figure. <laughs> Halle, Bay or Hall Halle Berry. She has uh, six toes. Now, when I, anybody ever hear of uh, Punnett squares in school? You ever do Punnett squares when you're studying biology? You know, if, you, if you have certain genetic traits, your wife has certain genetic traits, and you want to figure out if your kid's going to end up with those genetic traits, you could do uh, a Punnett square. So I decided to do a Punnett square on the idea, this theory that I had regarding the three women that got on board the ark. Assuming that Shem, Hen, and Japheth were 100% normal, as the Bible seems to clearly indicate, you got a normal male with a good Y and a good X chromosome. Now assuming uh, a 50-50 hybrid, you've got a female with a good X and a bad X. Well, the two of them get together. If the, the woman, uh, she uh, contributes her bad X and the husband contributes his good X, you end up with a Nephilim female. female. She contributes her bad X, and he contributes his good Y. You get a Nephilim male. Watered down, you know, they're getting smaller in the post-flood world. But you can also, she could contribute her good X, and he contributes a good X, you get a normal female, or the good X and a good Y and a normal male. You have a 50-50 chance of producing 100% completely normal offspring, and it's done. And if you look at the people in the Bible, what they produce, you start to see how some of those things certainly did happen. Whereas, if you decide to do multiple incursions, you end up with a big mess. You've got fallen angels inserting bad seed into good female. You've got a really big problem right there. And my thesis says that every, first, every male on this planet has a Y chromosome that goes all the way back to Adam. Because the only way you can get a Y chromosome is from the father. This means every man on the planet is redeemable. You've got a big problem, though, if you've got bad Ys circulating out there. Uh, and inserting into the, you, get, you know, it's a big mess if you do that. I don't believe this is a race issue. It's, it has nothing to do with race. I believe it's an obedience issue. 
Now, not all of Ham's offspring were corrupted. We, now, we did find a lot of giants in Ham's, Ham's offspring, but there's no evidence of bad genetics in Put's lineage anywhere in the text. Canaan's children, were at, they were loaded with Nephilim, no question about it. Um, there's only evidence of one in Mitzram's lineage, that's Kaftor, I told you about earlier, uh, father of the Philistines, who are mentioned over 200 times in your Bible, who had giants, had six fingers, six toes, double rows of teeth, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and with the exception of whatever was going on with Nimrod, there are no Nephilim that I'm aware of in Cush's lineage either. Okay? So, you know, he had some good, he had some bad. And I already told you about Japheth. Gog and Magog are questionable. The rest of Japheths are, you know, appear normal. And all of Shem's appear normal. So if you think about the odds, you know, obedience, there's, there's reward for obedience, right? You get a thousand generations with obedience, don't you? But the sins of the father are passed down what? Third and fourth generation. How does that happen? Well, consider this video. This is a video I saw, a TED video by Courtney Griffin, talk, talking about um, epigenetics, epigenetic markers and how it affects our genome. Now, she is not talking about Nephilim. But take everything I've just told you and think about that while you're hearing what she says. And I put a little few clues in there too, just to help you along, to let you know what I'm thinking. But listen to what she has to say about epigenetic markers and how they work. What is it that makes our cells different from one another? What makes them look and behave differently? What is it that makes a muscle cell, for instance, look different from a neuron? After all, these cells contain exactly the same DNA, but it's their epigenetic instructions that help tell them which genes to turn on and which ones to turn off. And with those different genes at play, these can become very different cells. So you might be wondering, when does all this epigenetic information get laid down on our chromatin? And the answer is that much of it happens during our embryonic development. So interestingly, when you were first conceived and you were just comprised of a few undifferentiated embryonic stem cells, which had the potential to become any cell in your body, your chromatin didn't have many epigenetic marks on it. It was only as your cells began to divide and receive signals and information from surrounding cells that the epigenetic marks began to accumulate and then the genes began to get turned off and turned on and the muscle cell became very different from the neuron. This brings me to a really important point about epigenetics. And that is that epigenetic marks can be influenced by the environment. And when I say environment, I don't just mean those surrounding cells that tell a neuron to become a neuron. I also mean the environment outside of the developing embryo. So the food that mom eats, or the prenatal vitamins that she takes, or the cigarettes that she smokes, or the stresses that she encounters at home or at work, can all be transmitted as chemical signals through her bloodstream to her developing fetus where they can get laid down as epigenetic marks that affect the fetus's own genes and long-term health. Now this has been shown experimentally in mice. Mice contain a gene called agouti, which makes them obese and yellow and susceptible to diseases like cancer and diabetes. This gene and these traits can be passed down from generation to generation through DNA so that an agouti mother will give rise to a fat, yellow, disease-susceptible offspring if that offspring contains the agouti gene. Now here's something interesting about the agouti gene. It can be turned off if silencing epigenetic marks accumulate around it. So, if a pregnant agouti mother is fed a diet which is supplemented with these silencing epigenetic marks, those marks will be chemically transmitted to the DNA of her embryo where they'll accumulate around that agouti gene and effectively turn it off. Her embryo will maintain those marks and so it will be born and grow up to be an adult mouse that's thin and brown and healthy. Even though this mother is genetically identical at the DNA level to both sets of these offspring, 
you can see that the diet that she consumed during her pregnancy can affect the health and appearance of her offspring. These correlations between maternal behavior during pregnancy and the long-term health consequences for their offspring are thought to be linked by epigenetics, much as you've seen here in the case of mice. Now, another important point to make about epigenetics is that these types of marks can be transmitted not only from a pregnant female to her fetus, but also from generation to generation if the marks are put down on our sperm or eggs. So if you're in the audience and you're not pregnant and you're not even thinking about conceiving, think about this because the um, lifestyle decisions that you make today can still affect future generations. Now this idea of transgenerational inheritance of epigenetic marks is still being debated and studied in terms of humans, but I should add that non-human organisms, mice, flies, worms, there's mounting evidence that this theory holds true. In fact, it's being shown in the lab that over tens of generations, epigenetic marks can be passed down. This actually brings up a really encouraging point about epigenetics, in that epigenetic marks are reversible. I think this concept that we can positively impact our genes is really profound and empowering, because we'd always worked under the assumption that our genes are set in stone, that they're beyond our influence. I want to end today by challenging you and myself to take the opportunity that we have before us to positively impact our long-term health by treating our epigenome kindly through healthy lifestyle decisions. Thank you. That was, to me, that was an extraordinary talk because it helped, us, helped me to understand why you see in scriptures things related to obedience and disobedience. These genetic markers can be turned on and off Biblically speaking, it talks about, you know, know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God and the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments, obedience, to a thousand generations, Deuteronomy 7, 9. Whereas disobedience, the Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. How is that happening? You know, sin, we think, okay, I did something bad. How does that get passed on to my offspring? It has to get passed on genetically. So I believe that that talk there helps explain some of this stuff. And you see, like in Genesis 15, 16, that in the fourth generation, they, the Israelites, shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites, Amorites is not yet full. Four generations of Amorites were going to do whatever they did in the land before the Israelites got there after the Exodus. Right? Epigenetic markers. If somebody was, uh, was studying to be a nurse... She told me they did a focus group study where they had people who had committed what they called poor lifestyle decisions. We would consider it sin. People who had committed murder, they were all in a focus group. People who had committed adultery in a focus group. People who were convicted thieves in another group. And in each of the three groups, they noticed that all the people who committed murder had a scar on their DNA in the same exact location. All the murderers. All the adulterers had a scar in a different part of the DNA, but everybody in that focus group had the same scar. And the thieves likewise. So it shows our sin has a, an effect. We know there's consequences for sin. Yeah, God will forgive us of our sins, right? But there are genetic consequences. And I also believe that when Scripture says that if many men be in Christ, he is what? A new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. I think we get a genetic rewrite. The blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin and unrighteousness, right? I believe it's down to the genetic level. We are getting a genetic rewrite. Okay? It's, it's, to me, it has nothing to do with race. It has everything to do with obedience versus disobedience as far as how those markers got turned on and off in the, in the children of Shem, Ham, and Japheth uh, and looking at what they did. Now, the whole thing is about don't mix the seed. We've been talking about the seed wars, right? Stop mixing seed. Genesis 1, 11, God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, herb yielding and, and, uh, seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after its kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. Right? Talk about everything going after its kind, after its kind, after its kind, right? Beasts and everything, winged fowl after their kind. 
and man created, God created man in his own image. Everything's supposed to reproduce after their kind. But just like in the pre-flood world, you see in the post-flood world, they continued the activity of blending themselves with animals. This is an obelisk called the Black Obelisk of Shamanesia III. This individual is mentioned in 2 Kings 17.3. Notice the elephant on the left there. That's a full-grown elephant. You can tell by the size of its tusk. Behind it, you got this lion-looking creature with human hands and a human head on a leash being walked by a dude. If that's a full-size elephant, look how big the guy is. Walking his little pet lion man. <laughs> Could that be the lion men of Moab mentioned in 2 Samuel 23, 20? I don't know. But there's, there's some compelling evidence that, yeah, maybe there were lion men. Let's look a little bit farther. The Hittites, their name means the terrors. I mean, why do you name your kid terror? You know, there's something wrong with that kid. They were carving in stone depictions like this, a different variety of lion men, a lion with a human head and uh, bird wings. Another one right here, you see two guys, one on either side, the human body and lion head. And then in the middle, you got two satyrs there, human body, goat from the waist down. Now, the Hittites are carving this. Hittites had a lot of carvings like this. Well, you got another really interesting story. I'm telling you, your Bible is loaded with stuff if you know where to look. And I found quite a bit of it in my book. I talk about this in the book. When Sarah died, it says that Abraham negotiated with an individual named Ephron of the Hittites. Several times it talked about Ephron of the Hittites. Well, the Hittites means the terrors. They're drawing depictions like this. And Ephron's name means fawn-like. So it appears, to me anyway, that Abraham's negotiating with a satyr for a burial plot for Sarah in the land of the terrors. And the Canaanites. Pretty wild story. Uh, you have other depictions of lion, human, and hybrid type creatures. The Persian, Greek, griffin, the charioteer of Delphi. Uh, you have other depictions, of course, the, the centaurs, the minotaurs, the satyrs, the Greek mythology, and things like that. Artwork such as this, the ancient Etruscan Roman bronze sculpture of a chimera, known as the Chimera of Arezzo. It's one of the best known examples of the art of the Etruscans another chimeric hybrid creature. So that activity continued even after the flood. They started to do that. Now we're going to take a break right now and go to dinner. Uh, and when we come back, we'll talk about the return of the Nephilim in the last days. So uh, let's go ahead and take a break and see you back.